بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so before we uh, move on to our uh, next final signs of judgment day I wanted to pause here and incorporate a very interesting uh, explanation of the beginning of Surat Isra and this is something that is relatively uh, modern as I will explain if you have a Quran by the way it would be nice if you uh, check your Quran right now the first pages of Surah Isra uh, if you have some type of Quran app or something please take a look at that so that you can follow along because this is now another interpretation of a very classical set of verses that some many ulama of our times actually more and more ulama are uh, interpreting Surat Isra as being one of the signs of Judgment Day. And if you begin from the Surah, it starts off with the issue of Subhanallah the Asra bi Abdihi, the issue of Isra, and the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala blessed the uh, Bani Israel and that He gave them uh, some some power in the land. Now the verses then go on. وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ This is verse number 4 of Surah Isra. Okay, follow along. These are very powerful verses. We, قَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ We conveyed and decreed to the children of Israel in the kitab. What is the kitab here? Most of our ulama said the Lawh al-Mahfuz. We decreed amongst the Lawh al-Mahfuz that to whom? To the Bani Israel. لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ You shall cause fasad in this world twice. You shall cause fasad twice. لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُلُوًّا كَبِيرًا And you shall reach a degree of great haughtiness. عُلُوًّا كَبِيرًا Interestingly enough, Allah uses the same adjective for Fir'aun. إِنَّ فِرْعَوْنَ Ya Hafadah, inna Fir'auna ala fil ardi. So Allah is saying the Bani Israel will have two periods of might and izzah that they will honor or abuse. Which one? Abuse. Walata'lunna uluwan kabira. Okay? You guys all follow me? Everybody on the same page? Okay, now we move on. Fa'ida ja awadu ulahuma. When the first of these two promises come, when the first time that you shall rise up, you shall be dominant, you shall have ulu and cause fasad. What is fasad? Fasad is corruption. Fasad is killing. Fasad is subjugation of people. Fasad is lots of chaos wherever you are. This is fasad. Wallahu la yuhibbul fasad. This is fasad. Fasad is caused by corrupt people, by evil people. So Allah is saying, when the first of these two times is going to happen, what is going to happen? We shall send against you. An army will come, a group will come against you. They are our creation, our servants. عباد لنا. We created them. You didn't create them. عباد لنا. أولي بأس شديد. They have great military might. They are strong قوم. They're not a weak قوم. أولي بأس شديد. فجاسوا خلال الديار. And they manage to go and probe even into your houses. They're going to go and all the way destroy all the way to your houses. وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَفْعُولًا And this was a promise that indeed took place. It is a true promise. وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَفْعُولًا Everybody clear so far? Okay? Now. ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَا لَكُمُ الْكَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ Then we gave you back a karra, a new chance. We gave you another chance. And we caused you to have a victory over your enemies. So from being subjugated, from being humiliated, what happened? You rose up again. You rose from the ashes and you developed power. And we gave you blessings. You now had a civilization, children, wealth. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا And we made you 
powerful in numbers. Your aktsara nafira means your manpower or your strength or your military might. All of this is allowed here, right? So you became a mighty nation. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ كَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَمْدَدْنَاكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبْنِينَ وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ If you do good, it's only for yourself. You will do good. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا But if you do evil, it will be used against you. You have power. If you are faithful to your commandments, if you obey Allah, you will benefit yourself. Your nation will thrive. You will become more powerful. But if you misuse that power, and if you subjugate others and cause tyranny and fasad, then that will be taken away from you. When the akhira wa'di, akhira doesn't mean does not mean the akhira akhira. The akhira he means the end of the two, the, the second one, the last one. The ulahuma is the first one, the akhira is the last one. Does it mean the akhira the hereafter? No. That's a misunderstanding that people might have when they don't understand the meaning of akhira here. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَ When the final of these, meaning the second, because there's going to be two times that they will rise up, right? When the second and final time, because there shall not be a third time of power. Ya Bani Israel, Allah has decreed, you shall come to power and be a civilization twice. The first one, وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَفْعُولًا It is a done deal. The second one, when it shall happen, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ لِيَسُوءُ وُجُوهَكُمْ There is a missing phrase here, and that missing phrase, we should say it is understood by the contest that Allah will send another group of people, and they will cause your faces to become sour. You will find that because when you're hurt, when you're irritated, when you're angry, when something happens to you, your faces scowl. After they were beaming with pride, they will now become scowling with anger. Now here, listen to this. And they shall enter the masjid. Which masjid? Ya audience. Aqsa. There's no ikhtilaf. The masjid here is not Mecca and Medina. Aqsa. وَلِيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدِ And they shall enter the masjid. Masjid al-Aqsa. كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ As they entered it the previous time. كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا And they will destroy whatever you had taken over with your ulu. Whatever you had done, whatever you had built, whatever had been constructed with your ulu, وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِرًا All of it will be destroyed and taken away. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَفْسُ uh, Sorry. Um, عَسَى رَبُّكُمْ أَنْ يَرْحَمَكُمْ Sorry. عَسَى رَبُّكُمْ أَنْ يَرْحَمَكُمْ Your Lord might have mercy on you. وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا And if you go back to your evil ways, we will go back to our punishing of you. That's what it means here. If you go back to your evil ways, we will go back to punishing you. وَجَعَلْنَا جَهَنَّمَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ حَصِيرًا And we have made Jahannam a place for the kuffar to reside in. Jayyid. Okay. Everybody followed the translation? Clear? Jayyid. Okay. You have a quick question. Go ahead. وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا No, because فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُ الْآخِرَةِ The akhirah here means that sit, end of story. There shall never be a third time. Otherwise Allah would not have said akhirah, it would have said thaniya. Akhirah here means there is no third time. Jayyid. You all understood the translation. Okay. What is the tafsir of this page of Surah Isra? Most of the early commentators, in fact, I do not know of any ikhtilaf from early Islam. And by the way, again, <laughs> I don't want to keep on bringing in the Ya'juj and Ma'juj, all the controversy happening is irrelevant to me. I preach what I preach and whoever accepts doesn't. But still, one issue. Some people raised the issue, oh my God, nobody before you said this. Firstly, this isn't true. In this sense, there have been alternative interpretations of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Uh, even from at least 80 years, people have been trying to rethink through and have alternatives. Secondly, here's the key point. Just because an interpretation is propagated in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century, it is not binding on the 15th century of Islam. This is the key point. 
What are we obliged to follow? Allah and His Messenger. Everything else we respect, we respect the tradition, but it is not binding. If we were to open this door, wallahi, I can give you many dozens of examples of classical mufassirin saying something that we now know is patently false, is just not correct, you know. Of them, a very simple one, not all of them, but many of the classical mufassirin said that the, uh, we created insan from alaq, and alaq in, in Arabic, one of the meanings of alaq is a clot of blood. And technically this is not true. The clot of blood, insan is never a clot of blood inside of the mother's womb. In fact, it is much more before it becomes blood. And in our times, alaq is now interpreted as something which is suspended, something which is hanging. means to be suspended from. So we look at modern science and we say, oh, hold on a sec, this meaning actually makes more sense in that you know, manner, and so on and so forth. There are so many examples that can be given. Here's the point. The interpretation of a group of respected ulama is exactly that. It is an interpretation of a group of respected ulama. There is no mockery. I'm not mocking. There's no making fun of. It's just their interpretation. Zakallah khair. Are we obliged to hold it until qiyam as sa'a? Give me the evidence. Qulhatu burhanakum. So here is one example that honestly so many of our modern scholars are rethinking through because the Quran is so explicit. So you, you see where I'm heading with all of this. You all understand. Where I'm heading there are dozens of modern ulama that have already said, I'm not the one saying it, but not a single alim 70 years ago held this view. How could they when the political world was very different 70 years ago? You guys know what happened 70 years ago. Not a single alim ever felt that this ayah is a prediction of the future. Every alim that I have read, I could have missed some, but 40 ulama that I've read, the classical mufassirin, everyone is considering these two been there, done that. From the past. And why would they not? Because in their time frame, the Bani Israel, there is no hope of another nation coming. They are scattered throughout the world. There is nothing that combines them. So they read these verses, they read history, and common sense, there's nothing to make fun of, nothing to dismissive attitude. I would have done the same had I been alive a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. That's human beings. Don't make our ulama infallible. I can be wrong and they can be wrong. They can be wrong, I can be right, I can be right, they can be wrong. This is the nature of human beings. These ulama, pretty much all of them, they said what? These two ulu have already taken place in the past. Done deal. And then they differed, as is to be expected, because there is no ijma. They differed which of these two. And some said, that the first of these was the Assyrian exile of 722 BC when the uh, Assyrians attacked the remnants of the original uh, kingdom of Israel that was founded by Talut, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, yeah, Talut and Dawud and Sulaiman, the ones who actually uh, founded the original kingdom of Israel. It, it then splintered into two, and then the last, then these two disintegrated, one of them remained, one disintegrated, one remained. The one that remained was finally gotten rid of by the Assyrians who attacked them in 722 uh, BC. And then uh, another group came and eventually uh, the Babylonian expulsion took place under Nebuchadnezzar, Bukhta Nasr, Nebuchadnezzar in 597 BC. So this is one interpretation that the first of them was 722 BC and the second of them was 597 BC. Others have said, and this is very popular as well, and this is the position of even some of the tabi'un. Some of the tabi'un, this was their position. That the first of these, uh, the ulahuma, is 597, when the second temple was destroyed. Uh, maybe one day we'll have a longer history about the Bani Israel. There were two temples, the original temple of Sulaiman, that Allah Azza wa Jal blessed Sulaiman with, that the jinn, helped him to build a magnificent structure that people could marvel at because it wasn't built by humans only. So this was the jinn helped Suleiman built the most magnificent icon in the whole world at that time. And this was destroyed in 722 by the Assyrian invasion. And then they built a second temple. And the uh, King Herod built the other temple which was then destroyed under the Roman destruction of 70 CE. 70 CE, after Jesus Christ, right? So from 597, sorry, from 722, there was no temple. Then King uh, Herod, or Herod built the temple again, and it was there for a few decades. Then in 70 BC, the Romans came 
and destroyed the temple and the wailing wall that we see today is the only remnants of the second temple built by King Herod or King Herod. As for the temple of Sulaiman, nothing remains. Wala shay, nothing. What we have is the second temple, one wall, and that's the western wall, and that is the wailing wall that you know, that was built around the time of Jesus, and that was now the wall that they go and they worship at. So, many of our tabi'un said, the first is uh, the expulsion of Bukhta Nasr, because Bukhta Nasr massacred them. It was one of the main massacres of the Bani Israel, and he was uh, yani somebody who uh, as, yani, uh, basically uh, almost exterminated them, then they had to flee to various places in the world, and then uh, in the Roman expulsion as well in 70 CE, another wave took place. Jayid. This is the classical interpretation that the two have already occurred. You understand where I'm heading with this? There is a modern interpretation that a number of prominent ulama from across the globe, and I mean, there are a number of names, but most of these are not to the level that we understand. Footnote here, generally speaking, students of knowledge stick with the madrasa they graduate from. So if their teachers said it, they will remain that way. So to break away from the tradition is not something that is typical, understandably so, and I'm not encouraging that. So whatever your teachers taught you, whatever you read it, Ibn Kathir and Tabari and Zamakh uh, Shari and whatnot, you will stick with it and keep on, keep on replicating. And alhamdulillah, there's no problem. Some people are willing to rethink through and break away. Sometimes that good, that's good, sometimes that bad. I'll be the first to say, not every breaking away is good. And those ulama who tend to do this, obviously they have to you know, face their backlash and, and whatnot, but at the same time, they're the ones who produce some very interesting ideas, such as the, what, what I'm about to say. A number of prominent scholars in Egypt, in Bilad al-Sham, in Palestine, a number of places, they are saying, why are we assuming that these are in the past? The Quran doesn't say so. In fact, the Quran only says one of them. وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مفعولة. The first one has taken place. As for the second, the Quran does not say that it has taken place. Why are we assuming it has taken place? And now you see exactly where we're heading with this, right? What other? So the first one would then be most likely the first destruction of the temple. That was when the glory of the original kingdom completely gone. And they have never had that type of political stability up until when? We all know up until when. And so, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَا لَكُمُ الْكَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ We give you one more chance and you were victorious over your enemies. وَأَمْدَدَنَاكُمْ We helped you, we aided you. You had government aid, you had the largest endowments from the biggest superpower in the world. You had everything you could have ever wanted. Right? وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا You couldn't have asked for more. With all of this, what did you do? إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ If you acted properly, that would have been for your own. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ So then when the second time comes لِيَسُوءُ وُجُوهَكُمْ means there's a missing phrase like we said another group will come and this group will eliminate the izza that you had and you shall see that your ulu and your fasad and your evil did not help you. And you will see it and your faces will demonstrate that. Now here's the key point that allows them to make this tafsir. The group that is being referenced here, it is not alien to Masjid al-Aqsa. This group has already conquered Masjid al-Aqsa at some previous point in history. And now they are conquering it again. وَلِيَدْخُلُ الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ Who conquered Jerusalem once before and wants to conquer it again? The Ummah and Umar ibn al-Khattab is the one who was the one who conquered in the first time. Jayid. So this is another interpretation and it is gaining more and more traction 
And frankly, this phrase, "kama dakhaluhu awwal marra," is very powerful. And in my humble opinion, it's a very, very plausible tafsir. Very plausible tafsir. And this will give us hope. And we already talked about the Mahdi and all of this. So all of this can also be over there. Jayid. By the way, this isn't the only interpretation. There are a number of other interpretations here as well. And I'll just mention uh, uh, two others. And both of these are scholars that I admire, even if I disagree with some of the things about some of them. The first of them, I will not mention his name because of political issues. So uh, he says that the kitab here is the Torah. And, uh, sorry, the kitab here is Lohul Ma'fud wa Qadayna ila Bani Kitabi. And he is saying that in his opinion, this ulu, even the first one, is not of the past. Rather, in his opinion, the first one is happening right now. And his reasoning is the phrase Ibadallana. Ba'athna alaykum Ibadallana. And he says, while it is true that Ibadallana can reference Muslim and non Muslim, because all of the creation are Ibad of Allah, he says the context seems to indicate that Ibadallana is a praise. And therefore they must be the Muslim Ummah. And therefore he is saying, that we shall see this ibadah lana maybe soon in our lifetime, then Ashrat al Sa'a will begin and they might get it back. Then there will be a reconquest under the time of the Mahdi and the Isa and whatnot. Okay? That is an interpretation. Another great alim whom I really admire, uh, Sheikh uh, Walad Dadu from Mauritania, great scholar, person who I've had the privilege to meet and somebody who I think is an allama and a bahar of our times. Uh, Sheikh Dadu, he interprets it in a completely unique manner, unprecedented. And again, he doesn't mind that nobody before him doesn't have this opinion. The Quran is there, the Sunnah is there. We are allowed to those who are qualified, to look at the Qur'an and Sunnah in light of our current times. Shaykh Walad Dadu, he interprets it in a totally different way. And subhanAllah, you have to pay attention to this. He says, ثُمَّ رَدَدَنَا لَكُمُ الْكَرَّةَ عَلَيْهِمْ Then we gave back to you, O Muslims, not the Bani Israel, the victory. And we in reinforced you, O Muslims, with wealth and sons. And we made you, O Muslims, more numerous and powerful. Then when the final promise comes, meaning now with the rise of a modern political entity and a modern country, now when this entity comes, they, they will sadden your faces, O Muslims. He swept it around, swapped it around completely. Rather than saddening the faces of Bani Israel, he is saying, Allah is telling us, O Muslims, you shall be humiliated by them. They had it once upon a time, they will have it one more time. You understand? He completely flipped it around, right? And they will destroy the region, the farms, the peoples, impose a blockade, you know, uh, have the largest open air prison in the world, and you keep on going all of that way. To the Muslims. O Muslims, perhaps your Lord will have mercy. Be patient. Be patient. Because, as Ibn Abbas said, every time Allah says Asa in the Quran, it will happen. Asa Rabbukum and Yarhamakum, your Lord shall have mercy on you. O Muslims who are being persecuted, O Muslims who are dying, O Muslims who are becoming shaheed, being jailed, etc., etc., don't worry, Allah will have mercy on you. Wa in Udtum, when you return to your deen, Udna to our promise to protect you. Completely flipped it over. When you are faithful to the religion, Allah will be faithful to his promise. In Tansurullah. And he goes on and on. So he completely reverses it around and he basically says, this is a promise from Allah that they shall rise again and they shall humiliate you. But Allah is saying, don't worry. The minute and the day you stand up to your principles, we shall return to ours. So this is a very interesting interpretation of Shaykh Walad Dadu. And I, while I respect it, 
with my humble opinion, it seems a bit of a takalluf. It's a little bit more of a reading into. And I think that this um, interpretation that, inshallah, there's a bashara or good news, I think that is very easy to hold. And I am very sympathetic to this position, especially because of the phrase, kama dakhaluhu awwala marra. Somebody entered Masjid al-Aqsa before, and somebody will enter it again. The Muslims entered it before, they shall enter it again. Jayyid. So this was a complete different long tangent that needed to be done when it comes to Ashrat al-Sa'ad, the science of Judgment Day. We now resume from where we had left off. And I was talking about the 10 major signs. And remember we said they are in no particular order. So we did the Dajjal, we did Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We now move on to the other final signs that we haven't done. Of them is the three earthquakes. The three earthquakes. And the three earthquakes, there is nothing that has been mentioned about them other than three Zalasil. No major description, no adjectives. We can't have any other thing. Nothing else is mentioned except in one hadith. It says one in the east and one in the west and one in Jazirat al-Arab. In one tradition, so one will be on one side of the world, one will be on the other side, and one will be in Jazirat al-Arab. What we can infer though is that these earthquakes will be to an unprecedented scale, something that mankind has never seen. Why? The very fact that they deserve mention indicates they're not your typical earthquakes. They're not a seven or eight on the Richter scale. This is going to be something totally beyond what mankind is used to. And that is why they are mentioned as being of these signs. Now, an interesting hypothetical question here. It does not mention whether these earthquakes are direct acts of God or perhaps caused by something we are doing on this earth. It doesn't say. Simply says, three times the earth zalazil will take place. So this goes back to a theory that I have been you know, hinting at. And again, in the end of the day, it is just a theory. I do not know ilm al ghaib Allah only knows ilm al ghaib I'm simply positing a possibility that all of these weaponry and all of this arsenal and what is going to happen when all of these people let loose upon one another, Allahumma sallim, what is going to happen? So either these three zalazil are directly from Allah as acts of God or these three zalazil are permission by Allah for humans to cause. And there's going to be three massive cataclysmic earth shattering uh, explosions or, you know, the earth, whatever three of them will take place in three parts of the world. These are three of the 10 signs of judgment day. Another of the signs, and again, I'm, uh, Allah knows the tartib, the order, as the Prophet said, these are the 10 major signs. When you see one of them, the others will come one after the other. We don't know the tartib or the order of the 10 signs. One of these ten signs is the Dukhan. The Dukhan. What is the Dukhan? Smoke, cloud, fog. The skies are dark. What have we been talking about all of these weeks? I mean, again, it is a plausible interpretation. A plausible one. Allah knows if it's, a, if it's something man-made or something completely directly caused by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Dukhan verse 10. So this is a sign that is mentioned in the Quran. فَرْتَقِبْ Just wait. فَرْتَقِبْ Wait. It's a threat. فَرْتَقِبْ يَوْمَ تَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ بِدُخَانٍ مُبِينٍ until the day comes when the skies will be full of a clear dukhan. Clear dukhan is, a, is an oxymoron. Clear dukhan means the dukhan will be manifest. The dukhan will be visible. I shouldn't say clear dukhan, that's an oxymoron. Dukhans are not clear. Dukhan in mubin, a manifest dukhan. A dukhan that is blatant everywhere. Fartaqib, yawma. تَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ بِدُخَانٍ مُبِينٍ يَغْشَ النَّاسِ It will envelope all of mankind. يَغْشَ النَّاسِ هَذَا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ That will be a very difficult عذاب. What is this dukhan that will envelope the globe? What is this dukhan Mushroom-shaped cloud. What is this Dukhan that will take over this whole earth and all of mankind will see it and all of mankind will recognize this is a calamity and a tragedy that is unprecedented. 
Now, it is possible. And again, I am not predicting ilm al ghayb I'm simply saying this makes a lot of sense given all that is happening. Sallim, Allahumma sallim. So the point being, there is going to be a dukhan. And this dukhan will envelope the whole world. And this, this dukhan will terrify the people. Allah knows what other impact it might have on the people or on the birds. Cough, cough. Allah knows what's going to happen. And the people will recognize this is a tragedy of the highest magnitude. Yaghshan nas. All of mankind is enveloped. Hadha adabun alim. This is a very difficult, a very painful punishment. In this dunya, there will be an adab from this dukhan that perhaps mankind has never seen before. Hadha adabun alim. Rabba nakshif anna al adaba inha mu'minun. This is dua we should memorize. May Allah protect us from ever having to use it if we see the dukhan because we don't want to be alive when all of this happens. Allahumma idharata bi ibadika fitnatan faqbidna ilayka ghayra maftunin. So who those who are alive when the dukhan happens, this is a dua they can say. Rabba nakshif anna al-adhaba inna mu'minun. In any case, this is the uh, dukhan. Now, FYI, just an advanced footnote here which is not a tangent, it is very relevant. Ibn Mas'ud and his students considered the Dukhan as having already occurred in a certain time in Mecca. That there was a drought and a thunderstorm, not a thunderstorm, a sandstorm came and it affected the Quraysh and uh, uh, it was like a, a, a type of punishment for them. So Ibn Mas'ud said, oh, the Dukhan has taken place. And his students followed him in this. However, the other Sahaba disagreed and this is the dominant position that in fact, the ayah itself seems to indicate that Dukhan is going to take place in the context of Judgment Day. فَرْتَقِبْ يَوْمَ تَأْتِ سَمَاءُ Dukhan. It's like, wait. Wait until judgment comes because this is how the Quran addresses the Quraysh. Wait until, you know, إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنُ بَعْدَ مُنَرَهُ قَرِيدًا Allah is saying, just wait. Just wait until the, the Qiyamah comes. So, the Quran and, the, and even the Sunnah mentions this issue of the uh, Dukhan and uh, the Sunnah does not mention, to the best of my knowledge, anything authentic about the description of the Dukhan. It simply says, of the ten signs is the Dukhan. Of the ten signs is this great cloud that will appear across all of the world. So this is yet another sign. Yet another sign of these ten major signs. And inshallah, my goal is to finish up the ten major signs so that we are, uh, inshallah, finished with these series today. Yet another of these ten major signs is the rising of the sun from the west. The rising of the sun from the west. And this is not something that the Quran explicitly mentions, but there is an implied verse. يَوْمَ يَأْتِي بَعْضُ آيَاتِ رَبِّكَ The day that some of your signs of your Lord will come. لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا لَمْ تَكُنْ آمَنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلُ أَوْ كَسَبَتْ فِي إِيمَانِهَا خَيْرًا Allah says in the Quran, by the way, this is Surah An'am, verse 158. Surah An'am, verse 158. The day that some of your Lord's signs will come, it will not benefit anyone to accept faith at that time if they had not accepted faith before. Now the Quran does not say the sun will rise from the west. The Quran simply says, when some of the signs come, Iman is of no use. Clear? Where do we learn that this ayah is a reference to the sun rising from the west? From hadith literature. And this is authentic. Bukhari, Muslim, Madi, hadith are there. And of them, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Mutafaq Ali, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Qiyamah will not occur until the sun rises from the west. And when the people see it, they will all believe then he recited this verse that when they see some of the signs of their Lord, it will not matter if they believe at that time if they hadn't believed before. So our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam linked this ayah with what? The sun rising from the west. And in another hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the first of the signs will be the rising of the sun from the west and right after it at Salat al-Duha, at Duha time. Duha is, Duha is what time? Duha is before Dhuhr. 
9 to 11 o'clock, mashallah, it depends on where you're living. But today in Dallas, 8.30 to uh, 12.20 is duha, let's say roughly, okay? So that time is duha. So our Prophet said, so duha is after fajr by an hour, before duha by five minutes, okay? Not necessarily by an hour, don't quote me on that, but you get the point. The Prophet said, the first of these signs will be the rising of the sun from the west, then right after at duha, the dabba will come. We'll talk about the Dabba in five minutes. Wait for me. The Dabba, we'll talk about him. Right after this, the beast will come. And the Prophet said, whichever of these comes, the next one will follow immediately. In other words, maybe the Dabba will come at Duha and the sun will come from the west the next day. Or maybe the sun will come from the west and the same day, because that's going to be the Fajr time, the same day the beast will come. So there are at least six or seven ahadith, three of them at least in Bukhari and Muslim, that mention the sun rising from the west. Now, this is something where, frankly, our minds have no majal. It is explicit, it is authentic, and so, sami'na wa ata'na. There is no ta'wil I can do. See, I'm not that bad. I don't make ta'wil of everything, you know. So, uh, yani, you, cannot, you cannot make ta'wil of this. You cannot make a reinterpretation. It's pretty clear. Yani the whole point now, there have been some people who say, oh, the sun can never rise from the west. So this means, mashallah, tabarakallah, American Islam will dominate the globe. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, you know this, this is a famous interpretation uh, that uh, some people of this part of the world, uh, they, they consider that, oh, the sun rising from the west is a metaphor. And the metaphor is that Islam coming from the west shall dominate the globe. And okay, I mean, that's a bit of a stretch because the whole point here, the Prophet is saying, the Quran is saying, when they see this sign, Iman is of no use. This means what? This is a sign that is simply beyond question. It's like the magicians of Fir'aun when they saw the staff become a snake. This is a sign, this cannot be magic. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is not some metaphor for Islam coming from the West because that's not something that is that amazing that the people will all accept Islam. No, that doesn't make any sense. This clearly seems to be something that we just have to believe the very last day of the existence, basically. The very last day of existence, yani the creation will change. And Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, and again, I don't see a problem with this because we're talking about literally, it's something that is before the trumpet being blown. It's something that it is actually understandable even. That Allah Azza wa Jal will Everything will change before the trumpet is blown. And how that will happen and the metaphysics and physics is obviously this is another issue where they come and say and to this we say indeed I don't have an answer but since the texts are so clear and again Sorry to go back to all of this, but again, there's a lot of misunderstandings. In my humble opinion, the Ya'juj and Ma'juj issue is not clear. That's why I'm allowing all of this. The existence of Ya'juj and Ma'juj today is not clear. As for the rising of the sun from the west, it is explicit. How can we reinterpret that? In this case, what do we say? Sami'na wa ata'na. We follow the Iman of Abu Bakr and say, if it's there, it's there. That's the point that we believe in. So, Allah says so indirectly. It's not in the Quran explicitly. But the ahadith are Bukhari and Muslim and multiple Sahaba. And this is the standard position of all of our ulama. And so we say that there is no uh, leeway here and we accept it as it is. And when will this happen? This will happen essentially on the very last day of creation. And that is why there is no point of a person accepting. It's too late. It's like Fir'aun. When he sees the angel of death, right? He says, oh, I see the angel of death, I'll believe now. And what does Allah say? Al-an, now? Rhetorical question. Now you're going to accept after all of this? No, it's not going to be accepted of you. And as our Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will accept the tawbah of any person until he sees the angel of death. Right? So when you see the angel of death, that is it, it is gone, there is no. Now, another hadith says Allah will accept the tawbah of any person until the sun rises from the west. So there clearly is an indication that the sun shall rise from that portion and it will be something that is 
manifest and clear. This is not normal. And this is going to be the final day and everything is going to come to an end. So this is the issue of the sun rising from the west. Uh, this hadith that I just quoted, that the dabba will come at duha time, now we get to the issue of the dabba. And the dabba is mentioned in the Quran. The dabba, the beast, is mentioned in the Quran. Where is the beast mentioned in the Quran? Where are our huffaz? Go ahead. Loudly. Recite the verse for me, please. <laughs> no. No price. He recited the verse, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا There is no beast in this earth except that Allah will feed it. That's not the beast. That is a beast. وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ So, thanks but no thanks. Meaning, جزاكاللہ خير. Where is the dabba mentioned? Sisters, you have something? Excellent. Yes, mashallah. Which surah is it? Which surah is it? Namal, mashallah. Very good. Surah Namal, verse 82. وَإِذَا وَقَعَ الْقَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَّةً مِّنَ الْأَرْضِ تُكَلِّمُهُمْ أَنَّ النَّاسَ كَانُوا بِآيَتِنَا لَا يُقِنُونَ This is in the Quran, دابة. Once the command has been given, which means once judgment is خلاص, that's it, too late now. Once the motion has been set in, that that's it, end is coming, the end is near. فَإِذَا وَقَعَ الْقَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ Is that فَإِذَا or إِذَا حَتَّى وَإِذَا وَإِذَا وَقَعَ الْقَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَّةً مِنَ الْأَرْضِ We shall bring out for them دَابَّةً مِنَ الْأَرْضِ A beast from this earth تُكَلِّمُهُمْ The beast will speak to them and it will say أَنَّ النَّاسَ كَانُوا بِأَيْتِنَا لَا يُقِنُونَ People would not believe in our signs. It's too late. Now we told you to believe. You didn't. You did not believe. And our Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith is a Sahih Muslim, Three are the things when they appear. There is no fa'ida in a person accepting iman if they hadn't accepted it before this. Number one, the rising of the sun from the west. Number two, the Dajjal. And number three, the beast of the earth. And this is a hadith that has caused a little bit of commentary controversy because Dajjal, can you not accept after the Dajjal comes? That's a bit of a controversy. And some ulama have said, maybe this is, you know, so anyway, that's it. But the point is, these two are explicitly mentioned. The rising of the sun from the west and the Dabbatul Ard, the beast of the earth. When these two happen, then there is no repentance. And if a person has not accepted Iman, end of story. Now, what is this Dabba and what are the details? Jayid. The Quran has only this one verse. The hadith, there is a lot of apocryphal hadith. Hadith that are found in the very obscure works that are not mainstream. As for the famous six books of hadith, the only authentic hadith mentioned, Dabba, and that's it. No adjective. No description. It just mentions the beast of the earth. There is a hadith in Tirmidhi that Tirmidhi himself says is weak. It is a weak hadith without any ikhtilaf. You look it up, the isnad is obvious. There is a person in there. Clearly it is weak. But it is in Tirmidhi. And it is not an authentic hadith. But it, 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 the hadith says that the dabba shall have with it the asa Musa, the staff of Moses, and the khatim Sulaiman, and the ring of Sulaiman. Right? So, it says that this dabba in one hand will carry the staff and the other hand a ring. However, this seems to be coming from Judeo-Christian sources where the beast will have the staff and the ring. This is, and the hadith is, is, is weak or very weak to be more precise. And even though it's in Tirmidhi, but Tirmidhi himself says that this hadith is not uh, authentic. In uh, Mustad Imam Ahmad, uh, in Muslim Imam Ahmad, there is a hadith that has an unknown chain. Once again, it's weak, it is not authentic. In which it says that the dabba will mark people with a symbol. The dabba will stamp. And stamp people with iman and kufr. Who's a Muslim, who's a kafir. And this hadith, firstly, is not authentic. Secondly, 
it is problematic in terms of his content. Who can tell me why? Yes. MashaAllah, how old are you? 14. 14. And your name is? Samian. Samian. MashaAllah. Samian hits the nail on the head. Despite his young age, he has grasped the problematic issue that this da'if hadith has with the authentic hadith. And what is that? It says the dabba will stamp people with mu'min and kafir. But when is the dabba coming? There are no mu'mins left in earth. So even from a content-wise, it doesn't make any sense. The Isnad is weak anyway. It's Muslim Imam Ahmed, a weak chain. So even from a content point of view, by the time the Dabba comes, the Quran, where is it? The Kalima, where is it? Allah, Allah is not being mentioned on earth. We already talked about that, right? That generation will come where there is no actual Quran left. So the Dabba will come at a time when it's the last day. Literally, it, it's the last day on existence. The Dabba will come out. And that is too late, obviously, at that point in time for anybody to uh, uh, accept. Now, uh, as I said, there are at least a dozen traditions that are found in the very obscure works, the very tertiary books that the average, even the average student of knowledge has not heard of. But there exist, you know, our literature, alhamdulillah, it's not just the six books of hadith. We have hundreds of books and booklets written in the first three centuries, not just six of them. And the reason why the six are the six is because they were the most authentic and the best and the most acceptable. And you have a lot of others. Uh, and in some of these others, you find some bizarre uh, understandings that the Dabba shall be uh, like the, 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 the she camel of Salih will be resurrected again and that is the Dabba or another said it is the child of the she camel of Salih the one that they killed there or what not so in any case um, Allah knows best but in my humble opinion uh, we don't have any information about the Dabba so we leave it at it it is a Dabba what does it look like you know what it has the Quran does not mention, the hadith is not authentic. It is one of the uh, signs of the last day and that's all that we know. Now, all of us living in this land have heard of the beast. We know the beast, unfortunately not through the Quran and uh, the, the whatnot. We know it from Christian folklore because it is something that is common in Christian folklore. The beast is of course believed in by many strands of Christianity and that is because the book of Revelations mentions the beast. In fact, the book of Revelations mentions two beasts, the beast of the water and the beast of the earth. And this is interesting because the title is the beast of the land. And in the Quran, Dabata min al ard it's very similar. The beast from the land. And if you, for the advanced students, those are interested, Revelation 16.2 and Revelation 19.20. If you want to look it up, 16.2 and 19.20, it marks the issue of the beast. And uh, the book of Revelations also mentions that uh, the enigmatic number is 666 that will come with the beast we have no, no such thing as 666 that's only found in judeo-christian literature and i'm just narrating it to you fyi sake we do not believe in this uh, in numerology anyway we do not believe in the whole issue of of numbers and we also don't believe in 786 by the way as well guys sorry to burst your bubble but no 786 doesn't carry any weight you either write bismillah rahman rahim or you don't write anything no need to write 786 at the top that doesn't bring the barakah it does not bring the barakah that you want to bring. And so it should, there's no point in doing that. I'm not saying it's haram kufr. I'm simply saying it means nothing. You might as well write 1, 2, 3 or 2, 7, 6, whatever you want to do. It doesn't mean anything. There's no point in doing that. Either you write it or you don't write it. Anyway, that was a tension. Let us get back. What were we saying? The dabba. So the dabba has no explicit information we let it as it is the quran mentions it the sunnah mentions it there's no description about it what does appear to be the case the sun rising and the dabba seem to occur within 24 hours and it is essentially the last of the 10 signs before the trumpet will be blown is that clear that's what it looks like to me the very last day it looks like from the ahadith that when the sun rises from the west the dabba will come out in two three hours because that's after fajr salat the duha time duha time and the trumpet will be blown on that same day later on someday that's what it looks like it doesn't say so but that's what seems to be the case and allah azza wa knows best okay we have one of the signs left 
and I'm mentioning it last, even though it is not actually the last, but it helps explain the last days of mankind. This is probably, this is before the Dabba and before the sun rising from the west. And the tenth sign is the great fire, Nar, the great fire. And the great fire is not mentioned in the Quran, but it is mentioned in numerous ahadith. Of them, the famous one is Sahih Muslim, that Qiyamah will not come until you see ten. And in this hadith he said, and the last of them, the great fire. So there shall be something called the great fire. What is this great fire? Combining all of the hadith together, combining all of the hadith together, uh, it appears that the great fire is something that will begin from Yemen. To be more precise, from Aden. In one hadith it says from Aden, which is the port city of Aden. And it will force the people. It will force the people to flee from it. And they will be forced to go to Bilad al-Sham. So the fire will rage. Now what will be the fuel of this fire? What will cause something that will scorch the earth one mile after the other and keep on going all the way from the tip of one side of the Arabian Peninsula all the way to the other side. And it is well known that in this land, most of it is nothing but sand. What will cause the fuel of this fire? Again, go back to some of the things I've been postulating and Allah knows best. So, there shall be a great fire at the end of times. And it could be miraculous, it could be something that Allah Azza wa Jalla says, all of this is allowed. And the people will be forced to flee for their lives. They will be walking, they'll be riding, they'll be running, they'll be on camels. And they will have to stop to rest. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Hudayfa ibn Usayd al-Ghifadi said, One day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to us when we were sitting in a room and we were talking about the judgment. He said, judgment will not come until you see 10 signs. Now we come to the end of our classes. Once again, I go to these 10 signs. Number one, this is not in order. Remember, he's just saying all of them were there. Number one, the rising of the sun from the west. Number two, the dukhan. Number three, the dabba. Number four, ya'juj and ma'juj. Number five, Isa ibn Maryam. Khuruj Isa ibn Maryam. Number six, the Dajjal. Number seven, eight, nine, the three earthquakes. One in the east and one in the west and one in Jazirat al-Arab. And the last of them, number ten, is the Nar. That will come from Aden. And Aden is the famous city in Yemen. Tasuq aw tahshurun nas. It will gather the people. Tabitu ma'ahum haythu batu wa tuqilu ma'ahum haythu qalu. And it will stop when they need to stop. And it will go when they're going to go. In other words, it is something that is truly miraculous that it will force the people to flee, but in a manner that they can still rest a while. So they will go because you cannot walk from Aden all the way to Bilad al-Sham except in two, three weeks. It's not going to be immediate. And in this course of time, people will be forced to rest. When they rest, the fire will rest with them. When they wake up, they'll be forced to move again until they stop and they will continue to do this. Now, once again, it appears that these people are simply not believers because other ahadith tell us that judgment will not come upon believers. And with, reg with, with respect to Bilad al-Sham, with respect to modern day you know, Syria. And again, when we say Sham, frankly, most likely it is Aqsa. When we say Sham, don't think of yani, the modern country Syria because that was what the classical Arabs call that entire region. But it might be Damascus, it might be Syria. But I'm saying technically, all of that region is Bilad al-Sham. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day, hadith is authentic, Muslim Muhammad Ahmad, he pointed to... Uh, the north, which is Bilad al-Sham. And he pointed to Sham and he said, in that direction you will be gathered. In that direction is Ardul Mahshar. Ardul Mahshar. What is Ardul Mahshar? Ardul Mahshar is the land of resurrection. Now, does this mean that Qiyamah will take place in Sham? Because Mahshar is, Hashar is judgment day. The response is no. There are two types of Hashar. 
there is the final showdown hashar of this dunya and then there is the hashar of judgment day in the next life بعد الموت بعد ال, you know the trumpet and whatnot the hashar of this dunya there is no qiyamah it's just a death and that's what he's talking about the ard al mahshar all of the last remnants of mankind will be gathered in one place all of mankind whoever remains will be gathered in one place and that is why it is called what ard al mahshar what will that land be bilad al sham and so they will continue to go there until finally they are all gathered in one place and then the final very end of mankind will take place and that is the trumpet being blown and we'll talk about that right now inshallah ta'ala but before we get there one of the things that has caused me to pause and contemplate for many many years and these are topics that I have been reading about and thinking about and reflecting about for literally 20 years of my life, thinking about these issues and whatnot. And one of the things that has caused me consternation, to say the least, is the fact that there seems to be absolutely no mention of lands and regions far away from that central areas. And the reason why this brings great consternation is because I happen to be living in some of those lands that are very, very far away and seem to have absolutely no mention whatsoever. It's as if everything is simply gone. All of the events, everything is now back to where civilization began. And I have no solid explanation. Allahu A'lam Other than to say The only thing There are no humans left Except in that region And that is terrifying Even as it explains a lot About what we are reading And Allah knows best I don't know what to say Really I don't there is no mention of any land, not even Africa, Egypt, China. These were names that the Arabs knew, the Prophet knew. It's not as if we can say, okay, this land was quote unquote undiscovered. Okay, how about Egypt, Masr? Right? How about other lands? How about Sin and Hind? Nothing is mentioned at all. At, we're talking about the last days of mankind. We're talking about Isa and Mahdi and Dajjal. It's really this area and only this area. This meaning? Which area? Bilad al-Sham in the Middle East overall, Hijaz and whatnot, you know, Makkah, Medina, all the it seems that will be the only region left. And at one level it does make sense. Because where are the big powers and where will things happen when they happen? At one level it makes sense. Wallahumma sallim. At another level we say Allah knows best. I don't have an answer. But I have not found any reference of any even a hint that there will be other places, things happening. Everything seems to be happening in the central region. And this is the region where everything began in the first place. Ibrahim, Ismail, even before Nuh. This basically, this is where it all is. According to legend, even Adam, all of this is legend. But anyway, so Allah knows best. I don't have any answer to this. Okay. Hmm? Right now we should go and live there? Inshallah. Make dua, inshallah. Wal madinatu khayru lahum law kanu ya'lamun. This is a hadith. Medina is better for them. So now we get to the very final point, inshaAllah ta'ala, of our series. So this is the end of our series. And by the way, I have decided what our next series is going to be as well, inshaAllah ta'ala. And it will be... Let me finish this series, then I'll tell you that. Okay. Uh, the final conclusion of this dunya will be what? The trumpet. The trumpet. And this is something that is very explicit in the Quran and Sunnah. This is very explicit. And the day, the sur, what is the sur? The sur is literally a trumpet. It is something that you blow into and that uh, uh, voice amplifies to the sound of a trumpet. This is a sur. And 
uh, as you know, the Yehud, they have the sur as their religious symbol of calling people. That thing that you blow into, it is something that they consider to be sacred and holy. And that's why if you go and visit the house of an Orthodox, whatnot, they will find, you will find this as an icon of their faith. It is something that goes back to other faith traditions as well. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that the blowing of the trumpet will be something that is very sudden. People will not expect it. وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ أَوْ هُوَ أَقْرَبِ The affair of the judgment day is like the twinkling of an eye or even faster than that. And our Prophet wasallam said, hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad and other books as well by the way, the trumpet will be blown. And as soon as people hear it, everyone will turn to face the direction of the sound. So the trumpet will be blown and all of mankind will look to where that sound is coming from. And he said, the first person to hear the trumpet will be a man who is busy repairing the tank that is meant to supply water to his camels and he will fall dead. And the people will start falling dead after him. So the Prophet told us the first person to hear the trumpet will be the one who's preparing the pool for the camels, you know. Now, putting everything together, these must be the people that are fleeing the fire from Yemen and they're already in a sham. There's no other way to put it all together. They're all walking towards Sham, the fire is behind them, and now this is happening. And this is taking weeks now, because if from walking from Sham to, sorry, walking from Yemen to Sham, it will take a while. And therefore, in the course of this, things will happen. So, another hadith seems to say that at some level, life is almost, almost back to normal, as normal as normal can be when you're fleeing a fire, but you're still walking for weeks on end. The Prophet wasallam said, the hour will not occur except that a man has put a cloth in front of him to sell it, but he will not be able to sell it or fold it up. The transaction has been done, but the cloth will not be sold. The hour will not be established until a man has milked his she-camel and has taken away that milk, but he will not be able to drink it. The hour will not be established until a man is repairing a tank for his livestock and the water for his animals, and he will not be able to pour the water for his animals. The hour will not be established until a man raises a luqma of food to his mouth and before the luqma reaches his mouth he will not be able to eat it this is a hadith that is very very explicit and it shows us what it shows us that the qiyamah and the trumpet will be sudden now if you look at all of these examples especially the first one buying and selling a garment life has come to some sense of normalcy People have to buy and sell even as they're walking for many days and weeks. So from this we seem to, to, to infer that the Qiyamah will be an absolutely sudden experience. No one will be able to predict the trumpet being blown. And life will almost resume to semi-normal. People will be eating and drinking. People will be buying and selling. People will be milking the camels. And then the trumpet will be blown. And the trumpet will cause all of mankind to die. Will anyone be safe from this? The Quran mentions an istithna. What's next? Illa. Illa. Man sha Allah. There is an exception. What is this exception? This has caused a lot of ikhtilaf. And we do not know because our Prophet wasallam said, Hadith is Sahih Bukhari, when the Qiyamah trumpet is blown, the second one, and I come to, I will find Musa ahead of me, holding on to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now listen to this. And I do not know. Did he wake up before me? Was he resurrected before me? Or is he one of those whom Allah Azza wa Jalla said about Illa Masha Rabbuk? And his first falling down counted for this one. What was his first falling down? His first fainting? 
when he asked to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said, La adri, I do not know. Is he one of those that the exception is for? So, if the Prophet does not know who the exception is for, do you think there's any point in me and you discussing it? End of story. There will be some groups of people. Now, our scholars, this hasn't stopped them and they love to discuss, mashallah, tabarakallah. Some of their views make sense. For example, some of the makhluqat in the heavens, the angels, the trumpet might not necessarily affect them. So, it's going to affect us in this world. This seems to be the case. Now, we also know that the one who will blow the trumpet is Israfil. Jayid. Is Israfil mentioned in the Quran? He doesn't have the ayah memorized, but you're sure he's in the Quran. Sisters, is Israfil mentioned in the Quran? You will get all of us in trouble. Israfil is not mentioned in the Quran. What is mentioned in the Quran? The trumpet will be blown into. This is what is mentioned. So someone is blowing into the trumpet. The name is not mentioned. One could say he is implied, fair enough. But he is not mentioned by name. That's very clear. How do we know, therefore, that Israfil will blow the trumpet from hadith literature? From his hadith. Is Israfil mentioned in the hadith? Yes, definitely. Allahumma rabba Jibra'ila wa Mika'ila wa Israfil. This is mentioned, for example. One dua. And in another hadith, famous hadith, the Prophet said, it is in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi, how can I relax? How can I relax when Israfil has raised the trumpet to his lips and he is looking at the arsh direction, waiting for the command to come to blow? This hadith is authentic in Tirmidhi. How can I relax when Israfil has raised the trumpet and he's just waiting for the command to come? And blow. How can I relax? How can I just take it easy when this has already happened? And one can say this is also one of the precursors of Judgment Day, but this is in the other world, not in our world. This is the world of the angels. In the world of the angels, there are some signs of Judgment Day. One of them, at some point in time, Israfil raised the trumpet and took the breath in. Now he's waiting for the breath to come out, and Israfil can hold as long as he wants. So, how close are we? So the Prophet is saying, How can I? How can I? The hadith in Musadrak al-Hakim, the Prophet said that Israfil is staring at the throne and he has not blinked for so long that his eyes are now glazed like glass out of fear that if he blinks, he'll miss the command. So this is a sign in the world of the angels that judgment day is close. So the trumpet will be blown and فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ رَضِي إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ How many times will the trumpet be blown? Once, twice, or three times? So our sister says a very good point. وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ ثُمَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَتِكُنْ عَلِمْ شَهِدًا This is the verse you're talking about? Yes. In context of Isa alayhi salam, in the context of Isa, Allah says, and this is Surah Zumur, correct? No, it is not Nisa. It is which one? Which one is it? It is Nisa? Okay, I'm mistaken then. Oh, you're right. You're right. It is Nisa. Yes, you're right. It is Nisa. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, in Surah Al Nisa, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that before, it's not explicit, but Allah is talking about Isa. Then a verse comes. You know what I'm getting confused, with, sister? It's Surah Al-Zumr. وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ That's what I'm getting confused with. There are two references indirectly of Isa coming back. Okay? So, Zukhruf and Zumr have this as well. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ And the other ayah, or the other interpretation, sorry, the other qira'ah. وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ And he is a sign of judgment day. Who is he? Isa ibn Maryam. And the ayah you mentioned, and there is no person of the Ahli Kitab except that they will believe in him before he dies. This has been interpreted by our ulama to mean 
This is a reference to when the righteous Christians see Isa when he comes back. They will believe in him. And this is proven in the hadith in Sahih Muslim where we talked about when the Romans will say, hand over the 70,000 of our people that are with you. Hand them over. We want to fight them. And we said, who are these 70,000? The only interpretation, these are the converts that have converted to the right side. Why would there be this mass conversion? Well, there could be because of Isa ibn Maryam. These are all interpretations. But the ayah is very clear. Before Isa dies, then the Bani Israel, the, 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 the Nasara, the Ahli Kitab that are righteous, that are good, they will believe in him. So this indicates that Isa is coming back. And this is something that is a fundamental part of our creed because there are mutawatir ahadith about Isa coming back as we mentioned. The Quran, we mentioned this, doesn't mention Isa coming back explicitly. But there are two or three indirect references. What you recited is one. What I recited, wa innahu l'ilmu lissa'a is another one. And uh, the one that inni wa tufiqa rafi'u also has an indication that Allah knows best. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Back to the brothers. Bismillah, it's good. So our brother says that uh, does the hadith mention where the Dajjal will be killed? And the response is yes. It is explicit in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet said he will kill him at the gate of Lud. Lud gate. Lud where Lud. And um, what the locals say, what the locals say, and this is something that I have looked up myself and I have verified this from both Muslim and other side. Both of them claim this. So there seems to be no ikhtilaf whatsoever that Lud is essentially where the modern airport uh, is of that, of that land. So it does appear to be that that is the place. And that is why the person whom you said uh, referenced it, referenced it. It does seem to be the case. And Allah knows best. Back to the sisters. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can, the question is, when we read Surah Isra and we see all of these interpretations, can we as a lay person uh, reconcile these differences? No, they're not reconciliable because either the two happened or they didn't happen. You have to, there is only one correct interpretation. Either the two happened in the past because Allah is very clear that It's literally two. Either they happened or they didn't happen or one happened and one didn't. All three interpretations are given in our time. So the average lay person, you simply should be aware there are three interpret actually more than three interpretations that's enough whether you choose to prefer one over another no problem but realize that all of them are out there and you cannot these are not all equally valid only one can be valid because only two times Allah is saying you're going to rise up and become a dominant force once again though to reiterate the only two times that that nation has had independent structures of political power is in the actual kingdom of the past and in the current kingdom, or the current country, it seems very clear to me, and Allah knows best. That's a valid interpretation. Yes, go. Excellent question. What is the wisdom of returning power to a group of people that are no longer the quote-unquote chosen ones? And the response is to test them, to try them, to see, okay, you wanted it, here it is. If you are able to live up, and that's why, Asa rabbukum an yarhamakum. If you did something right, maybe there would be some rahmah given to you. But if you're not, وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا Then, so this is the interpretation that will be given that. They are given this as a test and not as a blessing. To show, do they deserve it or not? And then you yourself will see, do you deserve it or not? And this is a valid interpretation. Inshallah, with this, we conclude this series. And we will continue, inshallah, next Wednesday after Salat Al-Isha. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.